afresh this morning with our moment of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus, who bears the cross and the Spirit, who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare in Jesus. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you now to share a time of peace with one or another around you. Our opening hymn this morning is Seek Ye First. Spirit be with you all. Our response to litany today is based on Psalm 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob invites us into holy refuge and holy sanctuary to receive help in times of our distress. Our God casts away our fear, even as the earth trembles beneath us even as mountains fall, even as seas rage against the coast. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob invites us into holy habitation along gentle streams of eternal joy. Our God is centermost, the one we turn to, even as nations are in an uproar, even as kingdoms totter, even as the earth melts beneath our feet. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob invites us into a holy peace, a holy absence of war, a time and space when all weapons are broken and used nevermore. Our God is exalted, the one who brings us to blessed stillness. For in all nations there is none like God, for all the earth is blessed by God's goodness. Our hymn of praise today is Praise the Lord, O Heavens.
love giver of life. You know all frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us. And guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. But you be seated now as we turn to hear from God's Word. A reading from Philippians chapter 2. If, then, there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a kid or otherwise, to go out into the field and do work without first having taught them what it is they're going to do. I didn't just say one day out of the random blue, hey kid, go mow the lawn, and expected him to know what to do. No, I had to go out, show him how to turn on the lawn mower, how much effort it takes to pull the string, and at eight or nine, when we were first teaching each of our kids how to do this, it took a lot more effort to pull than it does as they get a little older. It takes a little more effort to pull when it's a cold engine versus a warm engine. It takes the reminder to push the little bubble thing to get the gas primed in there. It takes learning what it means when you're pushing through grass that maybe you've forgotten to mow for a couple weeks so it's a little thicker and the blade doesn't want to go around as much and so it gets caught up and they're sitting going, oh my gosh, it's dying on me. No, 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 relax. We'll teach you, relax. All this they have to learn. You don't just go out there and automatically know how to do it all perfectly right. Which is also why the first time they mow the lawn we don't sit there and yell at them for every blade of grass they miss, which is half the lawn, usually the first time. But it's an opportunity to just say, okay, let's go back and catch what you missed, and we'll learn more and more as we go along. The other day I was out working with my son, and, and now he's got the lawn mowing down crack. If I tell him to go mow the lawn, he's got that figured out. But I was out trimming bushes, and I had the electric hedge trimmer out. I said, hey, come learn something new, son, because I know he hasn't worked this thing before, so now we've got to learn how to use this. And before I handed it to him, it's like, okay, here's some safety tips. Here's where you do not put your finger. Here's where you do not put the electric cord, or you will not be running anything if you cut that cord. Here's how you figure out you're being level and even. Here's how you go back over it a couple times to make sure you get everything right. It's all about teaching, it's all about learning. So we do this naturally with our children and the chores we ask them to do. So that, yes, one day we can be annoyed when they don't go out and do those things that we've taught them to do the first time we ask them to do it. So the question that comes for us as church is we look at this parable and ask ourselves how we fit into this parable and Jesus is sending his disciples, because that's the leap here, right? That's the connection. This isn't just about dad telling the kid to go out and do the lawn mowing today. This is about Jesus sending his disciples, those who believe in him, those who have the message of the good news, to go out into that field and share that good news. But why would we assume that we know what we're doing when we go out and into that field? to do that which Jesus is sending us to do. Where do we stop and take the time to learn what it is that we're being asked to do? See, before Jesus can be annoyed at us, whether we go out or we don't go out, whether we go out immediately or whether we say to him, hey, we got a few other things to take care of first, we can't quite get out there today. There's got to be an understanding that we at least know what it is that we're doing. So where is it and how is it that the church becomes a space for us to learn? To learn what it means to push the little primer bubble on the gas lawnmower, or how much effort it takes to pull the string, or where not to put the finger on the hedge trimmer. Where is it that we learn those things? We tend to gather most frequently, most often as church here in worship, and this certainly does provide a space for learning. This is a space where we do learn things, like the stories that are being read today from the gospel come from what we call Holy Week. There's something that we need to learn about this story. It matters when Jesus is telling the story. It comes a day or so after he has triumphantly entered Jerusalem on a day we call Palm Sunday, and on that day, he comes into the temple and flips all the tables over in the marketplace, runs the money changers out, yells and screams, rants and raves, has that famous holy temper tantrum. And now the next day, he's back in the temple and he's teaching as if nothing ever happened. <laughs> and everybody's scratching their heads going, what? We don't get it. Who gave you authority to first do what you did yesterday, and who gave you authority to do what you're doing today? 
because we didn't give it to you and we're the ones in charge. So the story has meaning and matters in that context. But how does that prepare us to go out into the world today, to know where the field is today, to know what it is we're to bring out into them today? Well, in this moment, it's really more of a proclamation moment. It's not a full teaching moment. There's no opportunities for the dialogue and for the back and forth conversations. This is that opportunity to hear proclamation of what God is doing in the world around us today. And we are hearing that we are being sent. We are hearing that Jesus has named us as his disciples. That's good news. Right? We're part of the family. That's not questioned. Jesus isn't questioning our belonging. Jesus says, here you are. I'm sending you. But before we get sent, we need to be trained. So where do we find our training? Well, as church, one of those places that we should be finding the training is by gathering not only in worship, where we offer our praise to God and hear this word of proclamation, but we should be gathering in times of study when it can be a matter of dialogue. When it can be a matter of back and forth asking what's this that we need to know and how do we. So, for instance, the Bible study that we had this last week, which I'm so thankful for all those who were able to turn out as we're looking at who our mission or what our mission is going to be going forward. And we were this last week looking at our past, connecting to those past memories of church life asking ourselves some deep theological questions along the way, maybe encountering a few bumps along the way in terms of our conversation or dialogue and not realizing, hey, there's some things we may not know and need to still learn. It's because unlike when I teach my son how to use the lawnmower at age 8, 9, 10, by the time he's 14, he's got this pretty well down pat. I don't need to stand there when he mows the lawn anymore. Unlike that kind of learning, being disciples of Jesus is a continuous, lifelong journey of learning. There's no moment of completed learning. There's no moment we are done and we say, okay, we have figured it all out. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for any of us. We don't finish Sunday school as a teenager and say, okay, that's it. I never have to set foot in a church classroom ever again. We don't kneel at the altar for confirmation and have the pastor lay his hands on us and we receive that holy ding, if you will, and the Spirit lays down on us. Uh, we're not complete at that moment. There's no completion moment. It's continually learning again and again and again. We don't have Jesus who's watching over us and getting upset because we missed a few blades of grass mowing the lawn. Jesus is standing alongside of us every step of the way, encouraging us, and drawing us in for more and more learning. And now one of the best ways we have for learning is our Wednesday morning's watch party of the TV series, The Chosen. It's a great opportunity for learning because we see the stories of Jesus and his disciples come to life in a creative and wonderfully imaginative way. And that leads to great conversation. Sometimes that conversation is, is as simple as, wait a minute, which character was this saying this line today? Because it can be weird to figure out who's who sometimes. Sometimes we're watching and we get to the end of it and we're reminding ourselves of the different Bible stories that were being covered in this episode. Sometimes those stories spring to life and bring out even more conversation and lead us into something that we can use practically in our everyday life. Other times it leads to greater questions that we don't have instant answers for, which is okay. Faith isn't about having all the answers. Even Thomas doubted after the resurrection. He had questions. Faith is not about having it all figured out. Faith is about the journey of learning every day, again and again and again. So this is the invitation 
that we get from this passage today. The invitation is to say, Jesus wants us to go out in that field to do God's will, to serve those with compassion and mercy who need to receive it, to bring justice to the world, to demonstrate acceptance and welcome and hospitality. And by golly, we know some of that, but not all, so what does it mean? It means we have to get together and continue to talk about it, to continue to ask each other the same questions over and over again, to seek those answers. Like our opening hymn said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Well, we have to come together to seek together. We have to come together to open that door together. For the field is waiting for us to head out to do the chores that Jesus is sending us to do. So let's learn more about what it is that John, he is asking us to do so that we can be excited and passionate about doing God's will with the full authority that Jesus gives us every day. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing, Guide Me, Ever Great Redeemer. confess our faith now, using these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the Church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We put our trust in you as we pray for the church. Give bishops, pastors,
pastors, deacons, and teachers the gifts of wisdom and discernment. Be with them in bold truth and faithful witness. Merciful God, lead us in your truth as we pray for creation. Empower us to look to the interests of others as we make choices that impact the environment. Summon us to be advocates for healthy waterways, habitats, and air. Merciful God, lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, and other positions of authority. Give them humble and willing hearts, looking to the needs of others. We pray also for our enemies. Merciful God, trusting your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and people who are sick or suffering in any way, especially Linda, Cassie and family, Isla, Tad, Kathy, Dolores, Erica, Dean, Emily, Chris, Gary, Cecil, and Janet. Give them encouragement and consolation in your presence. Merciful God, teach us your paths as we pray for this congregation. Be at work in us and unite us in your love as we labor together for the sake of the gospel. Merciful God, we give thanks for all the saints who died, secure in the knowledge of salvation. Keep us fearless in our faith and certain of your resurrection. Merciful God, remembering us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now for our offerings gathered through many and various ways, given with the spirit of joy and thankfulness, we pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The unending harvest meal of God's grace is set before us. Rejoice for all who are named God's beloved children are invited to receive. Rejoice in your invitation and unite your voices to sing of God's gift. us to his table, where he hosts this ultimate Thanksgiving meal. Here is where Jesus fed the 5,000 with an unending supply. Here is where Jesus called and dined with Zacchaeus and changed his life. Here is the place where Jesus shows his mercy and compassion with those once called outsider, unclean, and sinner, those who God now and always calls beloved child. Here is where Jesus gathers with his disciples of every age to share with them the meal of God's covenant. Here Jesus connects his whole life, death, and resurrection to the covenant of love from God. 
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Here we now exchange the labels the world gives us, outcast, unclean, sinner, for the only label that matters, beloved child of God. Here the gift of God is given, received, and celebrated with voices united in our unending refrain. Today we are receiving here at the altar, so come forward as the ushers direct. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing. This is a song called Have Thine Own Way, which isn't in one of our hymnals, but it's one Janice found and thought would be great for today. So she'll play it through for us so that we can follow along and sing it today.
the God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our benediction refrain is, go to the world, this is verse 3.